So 12 days ago, we started an avocado mead. Let's finish it up. As I said, 12 days in, still see some airlock activity. Does that mean anything? Maybe, maybe not. Could it just be degassing? We don't really know. 12 days is a little bit young to be doing anything with a mead, but you know what? I wanted to check it and see how it's doing. We also wanted to show something. People have asked, and I always thought of this as a very simplistic question, but I don't want to uh, make things too simple or oversimplify or overcomplicate for no reason. So we thought in the S in the essence of transparency, we would show everything. We normally use turbos, which is this big red bucket. It's like 12 gallons, 15 gallons, something like that, sitting on the floor that you can, you can never see. And we always say everything's sanitized in it. But today we didn't need to sanitize all that stuff because we're only just doing a quick check. So we got out our pitcher and we put some star sand in here. Read the directions on the label. They tell you how much to mix. Then we got the equipment that we're actually going to use today and put it in there. Now, Derek ran into a, an interesting conundrum here, and that is the cylinder, okay? It well, doesn't reach the bottom. It floats, and if you try putting it in the other way, you can't get any liquid into it. Well, now that we're using a syringe, I can just take this. By the way, this was already dunked in here and cleaned out. It's kind of a pain. That's why we didn't do that one. And I'm just going to pull in some water, well, sanitizer fluid, put it in here, Fill it up, shake it up a little bit, pour it out, done. Very, very simple. That is how we sanitize. We don't make too big of a deal of it. Some people are really, really anal about sanitization. Some people don't believe you need any. We fall somewhere in between. We like to be clean. We want to make sure that we're doing the best we can. But at the same token, you have to touch things. You have to breathe. You, I don't want to have to make a clean room in order to make brews. We've never really had an infection as a result, so it's all good. Your mileage may vary, but let's just take this bung off and get a peek inside here. And I am using our new syringe method of extraction. Why? Because the master baser made a mess. It is debatable on whether it was the master baser that made the mess or the user of the master baser. The master of the master baser? <laughs> Now, the trick to this, I, I pulled in really fast before, but I'm going to go very slowly. That way I don't oxidize and I don't get anything going past the seals. There's a lot of gas in here. I can see it already, which that's not necessarily bad. Just noticing. I'm not surprised because we haven't degassed this. I swirled it a few times here or there. I didn't really make a big deal of it. We don't do the swirl thing as much. A lot of people took that so seriously that they have to do a swirl like every day or I'm like, no, no, you really don't. You can do without it. It's just an extra little bit of help. Not even, not necessary. So if you want to, it's just something to do to play with your brews. Okay. That's it. This looks like coffee. Like the foam and everything has a little bit of a golden color to it. It's really crazy. By the way, I love the syringe. It's got the whole like mad scientist feel. This is just really cool. I love this. Also the 100 mil one, because it's one shot to fill the whole thing. You see how simple this is. Trying to get it to float. Oh boy. It's floating. All right, stick that back in the fermenter, please. The last little bit, we're gonna put that down in there. I'm just going to very carefully squirt it back in. You do have a tiny bit of loss this way because of the tube. But I mean, we're talking a few drops. And if you're really good about it, you can kind of suck in a don't little put bit. put it back in or no? Yes. Because you got air now. Oh, don't. And then you just do that. It's a few <clears throat> drops. But it's floating. That means it's not resting on the bottom. We can actually get an accurate reading. And if you remember, this started at 1.096 original gravity. And right now it is 1.016. So it actually dropped a significant amount in just 12 days. Let me make a note of that. Now, I don't believe this is finished. I think it's still going. It's still going to need some time. So this was just an initial precursory reading after 12 days to see how it was doing. And right now, I'm just going to pour this right back in. Now, some people will say that you probably shouldn't do this because of oxidization. I'm going to say there's so much gas being produced here. There's CO2 in here, not air. I'm not worried. But I'm not pouring it like sloshing it either. I'm pouring it carefully. 
It's barely making a splash. Well, now it is. And that will be what ruined my brew. No, just kidding. <laughs> Something else to be aware of when you're putting a bung back into a fermenter. Keep a clean towel nearby. Someone's gonna get on me because this wasn't sanitized. But here is the thing. That bung is wet. The inside of here should be pretty dry from before. If I put that in there, it's just gonna slide around, possibly pop out. A clean towel, and I'm just gonna give it a light, you know, dry it off. And then it'll go in and stay. Is there a risk of contamination by doing that? Any infinitesimally small, maybe. But honestly, your brew isn't touching that. So when you think about it, it really shouldn't be a factor. But it does make a difference because if that bung was to fall out due to being too slippery, now you have a chance for contamination. Not a guarantee, but a, a chance. So I dry my bongs. Hey, whatever. So what are we going to do with this now? We're going to let it sit. And we'll see you in a couple seconds with the next installment. Okay, we did one check. Eight days went by. Now we're going to check it again. Now, why do we do that? It's because if you just do one check, it was at 1.016. Is it done? Is it stalled? Has it just stopped because of any of a myriad of reasons? Yeah, I said myriad. That's right. Or is it actually still working? We don't really know. So that's why you take a reading, wait a week, take another reading, and then you have a better idea as to whether it's actually finished or not. And I put this on the wrong side. Clear out the syringe. Just like doing that. Okay. This is our new sampling method. Seems to work pretty well. Just go in there a little bit and I'm just pulling back slowly so as not to add too much oxygen here. This stuff is dark. It looks like coffee. I'm expecting that it did go a little bit drier because we started with a 1.096 gravity and I know that 71B can go higher than that. So 1.096 would be somewhere in the 13% range. So I know 71B has been known to go higher than that. That's what I was trying to say that I didn't say very well. Let me get this all the way down there. Is it floating yet? Almost. Now oh, it's floating. Get a little sample. I just like doing that. 1.012. Okay. First, let me make a note. Now, in my opinion, I'm going to let this go some more because it dropped four points in eight days. So I think it's still got some room to go. So I am just going to pour this right back in. Everything has been sanitized. It's all clean. So I'm just going to pour it right back in. I'm not worried about settling lease or anything like that because, you know, it's going to sit longer. But I don't think it's fully done. Now, it could be done at this point, but we'll know in a week. Is You see the idea now. You take readings a week apart when they don't change anymore. That's when you know it's done. Just jam that sucker in there. Good. But, you know, I do have this lovely sample now. Mmm, smells like a boche. It's got a little bit of a caramely scent to it. Kind of earthy. I'm getting the... The cola notes again. Hey, that's okay. Oh, the aroma. Actually, I get it on the taste. Wow, that is really interesting. Very cola. Earthy. It's young, obviously. Very young. There's a there's a strong bitter aftertaste to it. Yeah. It almost tastes like flat soda. It really does. <laughs> That's just crazy. But um, anyway, we have our notes. It's going to go away for another week, and we will try it. Oops. Let's do that again. There we go. And we'll try it again. See you in a week. Okay, 18 days have gone by, and we're going to rack this and probably put it into bottles today. So let's take our reading and make sure that it's really done. If you recall from just a couple of minutes ago, when you saw this, <laughs> that this was at 1.016, then 1.012, about a week later. So we're hoping it stays at 1.012, and that should be the end of it. And we can rack, bottle, taste, all that good stuff, and move on. Oh, 
goes yeah. in there first. It goes in here first. Got to <laughs> get the liquid out before I can take the measurement. No, we have not done any tastings today. The new syringe is wonderful. I love it. Yeah, the key to the syringe is just to go slowly. Other than that, it's perfect. Yeah, some amount of air does leak around the seal, I think. And also, as people have said, there is some amount of carbonation in here still. So there's some of that too. But um, I've just found it much easier. And if you w keep the air bubble at the top, it's fine. Go all the way to the bottom of that, please. Push it all the way down so it doesn't. Yeah. And you just have to be careful where you're putting it into so that you don't oxygenate, that sort of thing. Even though in this small volume, it's not as big of a deal. Well, it's a good idea to prevent oxygenation if you can. You don't have to get psycho about it. it. I've never had a brew ruined from oxygenation, so. Are we floating yet? Okay, yep. now we are floating. Do you want the rest of this on the pitcher? Yeah, we'll put this in the pitcher so that we don't spill it and we don't stir up that least that's in the bottom of there. This is probably my least favorite part about the syringe is that there's always a little bit left in the tubing, but I'm still trying to figure out ways to handle that. That. And I'll take this and take that back. Just, you know, going back and forth here. Okay, so it's 1.012, which means it has not moved. It's been a couple weeks. This is good to go. We do like to, before we bottle though, get a little taste and see where it's at. Our sample that we took earlier, we have a vague memory of not enjoying. Yeah. So it was kind of odd. So there's and, that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there's anything wrong with the mead. Okay, that's that's one thing I want to make clear. There's nothing wrong with the mead. It's just probably not to our taste, is the best I can say. It's a very um I mean avocado honey, it's you either love it or you hate it, from what I understand. So the honey itself we liked. The color is really interesting though. It's it looks, incredibly it looks like a dark. Coffee mill. Yeah, it does. Or a brandy even. It doesn't smell bad. Now, I let this go a couple more weeks on purpose to age a bit more before we got to this point. It smells like there is a lot more going on than just fermented honey. Yeah. It definitely smells so more that. complex. It's a deeper, richer kind of thing. She's not going to give anything away, is she? Okay. I don't mind this as much as I did last time. It's kind of raisiny. Actually, it's a little bit of a, a raisiny quality. There's a tannic quality to it. It is at 1.012 sweetness. And I hesitate to make it sweeter. Yeah. It's kind of reminding me of toffee. A little bit. And I don't like toffee. Okay. So there's that. <laughs> Trying to think if there's any way to improve this. Because, honestly, it's not my favorite. If I had to put a score on it right now, it's probably under a five. Um, that's concerning, and it's something that I hate to... I wonder if you spiced it, since you are a fan of spiced things. I wonder if just, instead of adjusting the sweetness, adding... The sweetness level is fine. There's a there's a distinct astringent quality right. to it. So but I, I know if we sweetened it, it would, it would I, stop that. I don't think sweetness is really the answer. I don't think tannins is the answer. I don't even think acid is the answer. No. So I'm thinking it just needs another, another punch flavor. of flavor in Something there. Something to cover up the nasty avocado honey flavor. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm just calling it like it is. Well, it tastes kind of bow shade i think we've already mentioned this sort before. of it tastes salty like saltwater taffy yeah it tastes so salty if you like saltwater taffy you probably like this just the way it is but i don't like saltwater taffy but what Do spice like oh uh, not in my mead um <laughs> but what spices would you want to add i i'm thinking Cinnamon, allspice, that kind of thing. To go. We've done cinnamon a, a lot lately. Let's do allspice and clove. Clove. Allspice and clove. Or we can be extra tricky uh -oh. and consult the birthday boy. But we're making the video right now. Yeah. Okay. Paul, coming for you. 
Yeah, this is totally unplanned. Hopefully he's available. <laughs> um, today is Paul's birthday. Paul's one of our moderators. Paul, what spices would you add to something to that tastes like a taffy? Avocado <laughs> mead that tastes sort of like... You're saying toff taffy or toffee? Because they're different things. Taffy is like that like sugary, one sweet candy weird like thing. This them. tastes like salted toffee. To okay, me. then do that. I was thinking allspice and clove. See, the trick to allspice and clove and cinnamon too is if you have flavors that you don't like, they covered things up really, really well. <laughs> they do. They do. And I really like clove, so that may help it for me at least. By the way, if anyone's curious, this tastes absolutely nothing like avocado or guacamole. Absolutely nothing like it. No. It doesn't taste, not even, you would not think this was avocado in any way, shape, or form. Okay, so even if you don't like avocados, you might like this. And even if you do like avocados, you might not like this. Paul's writing back. He's typing. Because, I mean, we have all that stuff. Like, oh, with, yeah, we with, have so many, we have tons. Would a floral note be good? I oh. don't know. So I'm asking Paul. Type faster. Are you drumming your fingers? That is me. Okay. Q Jeopardy music. No, we're just going to cut to the chase. He said, wow, that's tricky without actually tasting it. But yeah, if it tastes like salted toffee, allspice, and or clove, maybe cardamom. How about all three? All right. Let me find some stuff. Okay. So as life happens, so do plans change. So we were going to rack this. We were going to bottle this. And now we're not doing either. Right. That's right. We're gonna I'm just going to throw some stuff in the jug. Yeah. Because, you know, that's the way people really probably brew at home. They don't really. <laughs> okay, I have two half cloves. These are just small. So I'm going to use two, even though, be careful, clove can be overpowering. So I don't expect this to sit for more than a week. So two smaller cloves is fine. Could we put these in some sort of a bag or something? Yes, absolutely you can if you want to. I didn't because they're going to float or they're going to go to the bottom and it's all good. The cardamom pods... I'm going to try to break them a little bit. Do you bit. want the more and pestle or? No, I'm just going to okay. break it like that. I just want to kind of open it up a little bit. Drop it in. That's one. I'll do two cardamom pods. They're kind of powerful too. Okay, maybe. Ugh. There we go. Just breaking the pot a little bit, letting out some of those seeds inside. So two of those and then Man, allspice berries. I love allspice. Oh, smell that. It smells like the holidays. Thinking about that much. <laughs> it's like four, nine, twelve, fifteen, like twenty. It's it's about twenty. I'm just gonna drop them in now. Something you want to be careful of is we have not degassed this. Okay, so. There's very little chance of oxygenation by having it open, and I'm going to have to mix this up a little bit right now. So I'm going to do it once the airlock gets replaced. Whoops. Did you catch it? Okay, airlock back in. Now, a lot of people will ask, why do you need an airlock at this point? Well, because it could still be degassing. It's not going to be fermenting anymore, but it could still be degassing. We don't want to have any pressure buildup in there, and we want those gases to come out. So that's important. But I did say I was going to give this a little bit of a shake. I'm actually just going to do like kind of a swirl. I'm holding that stopper because I don't trust this. Now, there is a lot of lease in the bottom here, and you can tell. See, that's the gas right there. So any oxygen that might have been introduced it's coming right out. Someone will ask me too why I didn't sanitize those spices before they went in. That's a really good question. We are going to start sanitizing fruits and things like that before we put them into brews. We've had a couple too many issues, not recently, but over time, and we just started thinking about it. And I didn't sanitize these because this is like, oh, I don't know, 12% alcohol already. So it's not really such a worry. It's when you put things like that into primary fermentation that it could be an issue. Um, also, most commercial spices are inert, dried or baked yeah. or some sort of process is done to them to make them shelf stable without 
getting buggy and whatnot. Yeah, mold so, really isn't going to grow on these things. There's there's nothing alive on them. They're and they're anti natural antibiotics anyway. Yeah. So you're pretty safe, okay? Um, if this was a primary ferment, I might consider some way to do it. Maybe drop them into um, some vodka or um, just steep them in a little bit of hot water before we add that. Things like that. There's one thing that we're not going to do with our spices as far as sanitization is we're not going to put them in sanitization liquid because no. spices are porous. They will absorb some of that sanitizer liquid into them and that could possibly cause a weird taste or some... I think the boiling water is a good but idea. But the boiling water and... It steeps hey, it a little and then you just put it all in. in. Vodka too. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we're going to end up putting a rubber band in this guy because it's just not holding. People have recommended all sorts of tricks and tips. Here's the real secret. Use a bung that's the right size. Yeah. This is not the right size bung for this fermenter. I actually did some more research on bung sizes for fermenters because we've had such a difficulty and it was really frustrating. And some of the research that I found actually suggested size five. Oh. And these are size six and a half huh. or six. The so, problem I have with that though is if it goes all the way in, it's very easy to push it all the way sure. into the fermenter and that scares me. I don't want to sure. do that. So I'm, um, I'm happy using a rubber band to hold it down. Yeah. We actually get a lot of our rubber bands. They're thicker and small. We get them from uh, fruit and vegetables like broccoli. Broccoli. Comes with a rubber <laughs> band on it. Save those. And to do it, we never really actually showed you how to do it. I just go over the airlock, around the airlock like this, and then over the handle. Now, we kind of the trick is putting it on this side. Overlap the edge, yeah. So That way it holds it in place. Now, there is a good seal there. I can shake this up, and as you can see, it comes right out. Now, I do that on purpose, because if I put it on this side, it'll sit cocked. It's already sitting a little bit cocked as it is, and there's just nothing I can do about that. But it is actually held in place. Okay, all you need is a seal. It doesn't matter yeah. exactly it doesn't how have level to be it is. It's absolutely it. perfect. It just has to create a seal. So what am I going to do now? I'm going to let it sit. <laughs> and how long? I'm going to say a week. Because those spices can be kind of powerful. Granted, I want them to be a little powerful in this case. So a week to 10 days, uh, two weeks max. Yeah. And then um, we'll be back then. Yeah. So it's been like 10 days and our cardamom pods and allspice berries are ready to come out. I know I said like a week. Well, it's been 10 days. You know, life gets in the way, whatever. So what we want to do is get this airlock out and we're going to rack it to the new one gallon container. And I'm going to be using a wide mouth to do that because this is sitting right at about the edge there. That means it's about one gallon. That way we minimize headspace. Being that this is just getting it off the junk, basically, the lease and all the other stuff, it's perfectly okay. We can't see what's in this one. It's so, a super narc. Yeah, it's like molasses. It really looks like molasses. Um, so I'm going to probably get into some of the lease here just to get more product out. And that's perfectly okay because this, once it gets here, it's going to sit and this will become the conditioning phase or some people call it secondary fermentation. It's not really fermenting anymore. It shouldn't be. So yeah, it's just going to sit for a while. We can see that we have a decent amount of lease. It goes to about this mark here. Oh, yeah. um, so we are definitely going to put a cap on our Most definitely. thingy which is missing. By thingy, she means the auto siphon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and then it's got lots of star sand still in it. Yeah, it was in it. turbos. It's okay. So you know everything's been sanitized. Talk about that all the time. It's super important. If you're not sanitizing, you need to. Putting it in your dishwasher, probably not enough. Just so you know. Right. If you have problems getting the particular sanitizer that we use, which is Star Sand, just go to whatever brew source or cooking supply source that you have available to you, and you want to find a food grade level sanitizer. Make sure it says sanitizer on it. Right. Um, lots of people that can't find Star Sand have found an alternative by searching baby food sanitizer. Baby bottle. Baby bottle. Yep. So, yeah. Yep. I know um, Paul, one of our mods in the UK, he uses that. I think Adam does too, actually. And again, I put this all the way to the bottom. I'm not worried about a little bit of lease in here. I probably won't see it anyway. This is a true statement that clarity doesn't matter. <laughs> this meat is clear. You can't see through it. Stupid it's up. just pitch black. I wonder why they call other meats black meat. This should be black meat. 
This this is dark. Uh, when I did a research with Google Foo, Kenny, black meads typically mean that currants are added yeah. to them. So it's just a name they made. Yep. Just like everything There's else. There's so many names for meads. We did soak up a little bit of chocolate milk at the bottom there, but that's okay. <laughs> I knew we would. And I think we did good choosing this bottle because you can see it goes right to about there. Now, something I want to point out, um, somebody asked me why we didn't do a reading on one of our things. Now, this one, we did a reading on June 11th, which is like a month ago, and it was 1.012. We did another reading when we racked it and added the cardamom pods and allspice berries, and it was 1.012. We added cardamom pods, cloves, and allspice berries. None of those are a fermentable product. Therefore, this will not be fermenting anymore. It sat for a couple of weeks at 10-12, so it's perfectly fine. I will probably take one just before we bottle, just to be on the safe side, but for today, it wasn't really necessary. We will, however, be taking a quick tasting sample, oh, yeah. just to make sure that the addition of the spices didn't make another issue that we need to tweak further. Oh yeah, you never know. These things can be crazy. While I have it in my head, I want to share with you a quick pro tip. Oh <laughs> and it's going to be really simple and like, well, duh, I thought of that, but some people might not have. And that's when you have a uh, racking situation and you get a lot of gunk in your auto siphon. Don't put that auto siphon directly into your sanitation bucket, particularly if you're oh, going to yeah. work with more brews. Just take it to your sink and rinse it out really good and then put it into your sanitizer sanitization bucket because that way you won't contaminate your sanitizer right and yes we make a new batch of sanitizer every time we have a session of brewing right, i put the lid on because i don't want to have too much air contact with this but in the glass as i was filling the glass i can tell this is actually pretty clear when there was only a little bit in there you could totally see through it it's just so incredibly dark it literally looks like coffee or molasses or something like that but on the smell, oh yeah, those spices are coming through. It really is starting to smell like a methaglin to me. Yeah. I think it's if it has those caramelized notes that it had before mixed with those spices, this could be a real winner for me. I wasn't thrilled with it before we added the spices, so I'm really curious. Now, mm. we mentioned this in one of our tasting oh, videos, but if you noticed what I was doing, I might have looked a little odd and, you know, I don't care. That's what you got to do sometimes. To get a good sense of all the different aromas in the bouquet of the beverage, if you leave your mouth partly open, and I do that by pushing my tongue against my front teeth, and you move from nostril to nostril as you're inhaling and then exhale through your mouth, it, it coats all of your senses, all your different receptors, so you can get the full aspect of how the smell smells. And the smell smells really, really awesome. Now taste it. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. See, he's, he's got his hand there to try to... I already saw it. <laughs> ...retain his poker face. I couldn't face. hide it. Now, as I was breathing in while I was preparing to take a taste, I instantly got a sensation of cola. The taste probably tastes like old, 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 old fashioned cola back in the day cola. It certainly doesn't taste like the over. I'm pretty sure if old fashioned cola tasted like this, Coca Cola would not be in business anymore. Well, just saying. If you think about the old root yeah. beers and stuff, they have kind of a funk to them. This is kind of got. Yeah. A this is not my favorite. I'll just say it right now. This, this <laughs> it is smells better favorite. than it tastes. Oh, yeah. Um, initially, I don't mind it so much, but like There's the an end is just kind of... Mm -hmm. Now... Almost like burnt coffee. Yes. That's what it is. There's an extremely bitter aftertaste to this. That's just weird. And it's got to be just a remnant of the honey. It can't be anything else because it was there before. Yeah. The spices improved this drastically. Don't get me wrong, because it's not through the whole taste. Now it's just on the back end. I'm not sure what to do with this. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't think adding more honey is going to help with the bitterness. I think it will. It will 
add to the sweetness, but the inherent nature of fermenting honey leaves a bitter aftertaste. So yeah, but it's not going to ferment. I know it's, it's not going to ferment anymore. I just, I don't. Well, I don't, I don't we'll know. have to think about that, and we'll be back with the next installment of what we do to this mead. And we're back, and it's been oh four days. What do you know? Been four days. We racked we racked this on uh, July 9th. Today is July 13th. So yeah, four days. The reason we let this go a little bit is A, so I could put up a poll to see what you guys thought we should do. And B, I wanted this to clear out just a little bit more. And it was a good thing I did. Some junk fell out, also known as sediment or lease or lees, depending on how you like to say it. I say lease because that's how I was told. Just how it is. So what we're going to do is rack it off of that, put it into a pitcher, and then we're going to play with some additions, or an addition, and we'll see how it goes. Someone asked in one of our racking videos, what is racking? And I would have thought we explained it, but just for those that we didn't explain it to, racking means to take it from one vessel to another, usually to remove it from something, whether it's lease, get it off the fruit, that kind of thing. It's usually done with a siphon. Okay, that is what racking is. It's a very simple concept, but it's very common in brewing. We're using an auto siphon to do it. I am leaving the cap on. We put this end in the source. The other end is in the destination, which is just below this. They have to be at different heights or else it doesn't work. And I just go, you know, a little bit of the way in, start it up. And then I will drop this down and let it all go in. There we go. Alright, so we ended up with 3.4 liters, which is like 110, 108 ounces, okay? So what I want to do, though, is get a final reading as a baseline, as well as a control, if you will. Because if we end up sweetening this, every time I pick that up, this hides water. <laughs> and it just, when you pick it up, it falls on my leg. I'm wearing shorts because it's Florida. And, you know, it's kind of like, whoa, okay. <laughs> anyway. So what I want to do is get a reading because it'll give me uh, an idea of where it is now and if we change anything, where it is then. The exact amounts that we add aren't as critical as knowing how it tastes, though. Like even the readings at this point, it's not science anymore. Now it's bias. It's personal bias as to flavors. What Brian is alluding to is we both think that this is probably going to require some back sweetening. Yep. And because the sweetness level is a very personal judgment call, it really doesn't matter how much sweetness we add to our brew, you're going to want to determine what's the best sweetness level for you as to how much you should right. add to your brew. And so we're going to show you how we're going to be adding that to this so you can use that method rather than the exact amount to make it um, work for you. <laughs> this all comes from, we did a video recently where um, the honey was crystallized in the bottom and I had to shake it up and I said, now we just won't know how much honey we used. And everybody and their brother gave me suggestions as to how I could have known how much honey I used. And that's great. It's good to know that, but it's not absolutely necessary because honeys do vary. It's a natural product. We've seen it. Bevy's honey is totally different than any other honey we use. So in that respect, the actual amounts I used are almost doesn't even matter. If you can't have that honey, you have a different honey. But my gravity reading, that's what matters. And we did have a gravity reading. Now, again, even gravity reading, if I say mine was 1.092, you don't have to go crazy to get 1.092. If you're within five, even 10 points of that, you're fine. Absolutely fine. Now, if you're at the upper range, like 1.130, 1.140, 10 points more, probably not a good idea. 10 points less, much better. Anyway, let's get a reading here. So as expected, this did not drop at all. It's still 1.012, but that does give me a baseline where to go. Right now, though, I'd like to take a taste of this, and we'll see what we're going to add. Now, this is only about seven weeks old, so you have to also prepare that it's going to change over time. It's not what it is today is what it's always going to be. It's going to probably improve, and those spices will mellow a bit and things like that. So, you know, there's hope, even if it's not spot-on amazing right now. Now, last time we visited this, I said it reminded me of a cola, and Brian's like, no, it doesn't. Well, it sort of does. Yeah, 
It, it even smells like a super concentrated old-timey cola. Like the stuff that you might buy at the store to make your new version of old-time cola. That's what it smells like. Yes, it sort of does. It's not completely cola-like, but it's close. And the one thing it's lacking is sweetness. That's what's missing. Without a doubt, that is that is my assessment. It's very tannic and acidic. So when you take the trifecta, it doesn't have the sweetness to balance those two things yeah. out. I don't hate the flavors anymore. I didn't actually like it last time. I don't hate the flavors, but I think it needs to be sweeter. I'm just, because I'm so fixated on this cola thing and to cola preface sweet. that, I don't really like cola. I know I'm a weird person, but we don't really drink it. I, I'm wondering if it was sweetened and carbonated, if it would actually taste like cola. Uh, we could carbonate it if you really want to. I know that's really kind of that's complicated and probably not necessary um, at all. But. Well, it would be it would be complicated. Not really something I want to yeah. do on this one. But maybe we'll revisit that sometime. However, what I am going to do today, and yes, we kind of already knew we were going to do this, is I'm going to sweeten this, okay? And we're going to show you guys how to back sweeten it. But there's one little thing. This was 71B yeast, and we know that this started at 1.09... I'm, I'm looking at notes here on purpose. This started at 1.096, right? Let me figure out some ABV for you, because I think I've done it 15 times in this video already. But <laughs> 1.096 minus 1.012... Gives us 0.084 times 135. That is 11.3%. That is below the alcohol tolerance of 71B. So if I back sweeten this, there's a very strong chance, and I mean very strong chance, it will kick right back into fermentation again. And that's not what I want it to do. Now we have racked it twice. So there is a possibility it might not, because we might have got enough of the yeast right. out. But it's always better to play it this on the safe side. This is one of those in-between moments where you go, okay, if we're going to leave it like this, we can totally bottle this and it's fine. It's stable. It has not moved in a month. Okay. Four weeks of sitting hasn't moved. However, once we change the paradigm, once I add more honey to this, it's very possible it'll kick right back up again. So we're going to sweeten it and then we're going to pasteurize it. And I'm going to show you an yet another method for pasteurization. So a while back, Derek Skinner sent us a bunch of honey. And some of them have an M on the top. Maybe it's a W. I'm not sure. Others do not. And I know one of them was just a standard honey, like a wildflower. Unfortunately, the actual notes have been lost to oblivion. So we're guessing here. But it is sitting on the shelf over there. And we've been kind of waiting to figure out what to do with it. <laughs> now, because this was avocado honey, it's very strong, has a very distinct flavor. If I want to sweeten this, I want to sweeten it neutrally. So I believe this to be a wildflower honey or some sort of flower floral honey. I smelled it. It actually smells really neutral like a, like a wildflower. So my idea is to add some of this to it. Now, how much? Notice there's no scale. Why? I'm trying to prove a point. This isn't about weight or measurement. This is about personal bias and taste. Back sweetening is a very personal thing. People ask me all the time, how much should I add to back sweetening? And I can't really answer that. Do you like dry? Do you like sweet? How sweet do you like it? Some people think 1.050 is just right. Some people think 0.996 is too sweet. I've had both of those comments. Yeah. So there's no way to say. For us, I know we used to go for 1020 to 1030, 1.020 to 1.030. Now our tastes are changing a bit. So instead of measuring it out and making a guess, I'm going to pour some in, mix it up, and taste it. And if we don't like it, I'm going to add more. <laughs> so the trick to this is you can always add more, but you can't remove it once yeah. you put it in. So I know this is about a pound. I'm going to put in like a third of this jar. That should be like 10 points, which I believe it needs at least 10 points. Okay, so it was, yeah, that's about a third. Maybe a little bit more. I'm not even going to put the lid on because there's just honey all over the side. And now I'm going to mix it up. Now, I also noticed when I was taking the reading that there was some gas in here. So this is going to degas at the same time as mix, which is a good thing. That way we don't pop corks and things like that later on. 
Plus, gas over time can make off flavors and things, so it's a good idea to degas before you bottle. Our intent is to bottle this today. We have had problems with this one. Well, not problems, but we have... It's thrown us for a loop. Yeah, it's had to be changed, and that's part of the joy of brewing at home. You never really know what a brew is going to be, and you can make the same recipe ten times, and then one time you go, you know what, this doesn't taste the same, so let me change it, or addend it is really all you're doing. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's your brew. In this case, we're trying to make something that we appreciate and would want to drink. As it stands right now, if I had to give this a rating, it's like a 1.5 to a 2. The flavors are odd to me because there's no sweetness there. It's kind of like fruit without sweetness. Uh, spices without sweetness just doesn't taste right. And that's exactly what I'm getting. It's like a burnt coffee, spiced, spiced burnt coffee with no sugar added. Doesn't sound all that appetizing, but that's kind of what it tastes like. I'm just gonna pour a little bit into the glass here. Color didn't change. It very much does have a Boucher like quality though. Yeah. That's significant. Mm. It's close. I think it needs more. Mm -hmm. But it's it definitely, like, it took it from a 1.5 to, uh, to a 2, maybe up to like a 5, 4. It does taste very cola-like. It does. All right, so let me put in eh, a little bit more. Notice how scientific we are being today. <laughs> now that's to prove a point. And the point is... You can try to be scientific, okay? But it's homebrew. There's always some approximation. And like I keep saying, it's not about how much honey I put in here. If you're trying to do this at home, you don't have the same honey as me. You don't have the same avocado as me. Avocado honey as me. You don't have Derek Skinner's honey. You don't have the exact same measurement as me. There's so many variables. Your temperatures could have been different. You might have used a different yeast. You might have a different batch of the same yeast. There's so many variables here. So having the exact numbers almost doesn't even matter anymore. It's good to have a ballpark idea. The trick to this, though, is this is very dark. So you want to really make sure you mix that honey in good. So we'll just pour another little sample. That was a little bit more than a little sample. But whatever. At this point, I've used about half the bottle, which by rights should be 15 to 17 points. So that should make this like a 10, 25, which is kind of on the high side now. It's starting to get into that sweet range but i think it was so tannic so acidic it really needed it sometimes you do it's funny it doesn't taste sweet it tastes balanced now do i want more though i think i want to touch more if you want. Okay. May I have the spoon again, please? And you see that this is an experimentation process. It's put some in, mix it thoroughly, taste it. Not good enough? Add some more. Not good enough? Add some more. Eventually, you hit the sweet spot. Right now, I've used up about half that pound. I'm just going to go a couple more quick little dollops here. Like, maybe now I'm at two-thirds of the jar. Yeah, I think I'm at about two-thirds of the jar. And that's it. Walk away. Put it away. By the way, Derek Skinner, if you're watching this and you know what you sent us, could you please let me know? Because I'd actually like to know what the other honey is so that we can make a specialty mead using that. Thanks. Okay, so now that we're here, just for, you know, science, I'm going to take a final reading. That way we know what the gravity of this is. Not that it really matters, but it's just, you know, good to know approximately how much we really added. Okay, so it really only added 10 points, all that honey. So it just goes to show you, had I said add two-thirds of a pound of honey, you would think, well, that's going to be like 20 points, 22 points. Nope, it actually only added 10 points. So honeys vary, which is probably why I needed to add so much. I, I could add more, actually, but I'm not going to. So what I'm going to do now is just pour this back in carefully so I don't oxidize which I know somebody's going to say, I oxidize it anyway. Well, guess what? Sometimes you got to do what you got to do. Okay. I didn't add that much. 
And now we're going to bottle. And, you know, just like we always do, we're going to use a bottling wand that has stem valve on the end. We're going to put it onto our hose on the end of the siphon. One end in the bottle, the other end into the auto siphon, into the pitcher, and away we go. Oh, I don't need the cap though. The cap is to keep it out of the lease when there's sediment. There's no sediment in here, so I can just put this all the way to the bottom, get it started, and we're good. And we'll see you in uh, about six or seven 16 ounce bottles. Okay, so we have finished bottling, and we got seven bottles and one, well, this is the seventh bottle, but one of them is not going to get pasteurized. This is going to be our taster. We're probably going to drink almost half of it during the tasting, and then the other half we'll put in the fridge, and that'll get drank in the next 24 hours, so we don't really have to worry about re-fermentation. The rest we're going to pasteurize using sous vide. Now, the sous vide is the method. An immersion heater, immersion heater circulator is actually the term, or immersion circulator, whatever. We're going to use that to, to pasteurize. I have some water in here. I have all the bottles in here. However, one thing that I don't have is an empty bottle because they don't all fit. So I'm going to test something. This is sort of like a little bit of an experiment. I have always believed that if you leave one bottle open, like I just did, if you leave a bottle open when you pasteurize it, that the alcohol escapes. Now, I was told by a viewer who is actually a chemist that the minor, minute amount that you lose is so insignificant. He said it's incredibly small. So I'm curious. So what I'm going to do is use my thermometer in that one. And then at the end, I'm going to take readings on them all. And there's a specific reason why I want to do that. Because you think, okay, well, I know gravity readings measure the specific density of the liquid, right? Well, if the alcohol has left the building, then the specific gravity should change, right? Even if it's a few points change, that's significant. We know we were at 1.022. So anything different than that would mean it's changed. Now I'm going to read both of them because as they heat up, the specific gravity can also change. So the rest of them are going to stay closed. One bottle is going to stay open. Actually, you know what? For the sake of science, let's open two bottles. Let's make them clear ones though, because I don't know if the amber bottle could make a difference. So I'm going to leave two open, three closed, four closed really, but three that count. And afterwards, I'll take readings on those bottles and see if there's any difference. But for now, what I want to do is get some hot water, pour it into here. I'm pouring hot water in. Um, there was already some water put in, okay? So that way I'm not pouring boiling water. It's hot. It was probably like 160 degrees or so by the time I got to it. That way it doesn't take, you know, like three hours for the uh, immersion heater to get up to temperature. And now I do need a little bit more water than that. All right, so what I want to do is I know I want these to be 140 degrees internal temperature for about 15 to 20 minutes. So I'm setting the temperature on this to actually, I'm going to go to 145. That way I know it'll be a little bit higher and I'm going to set a timer for 30 minutes. That should do. So we'll see you in about 30 minutes. So something we're noticing while this is going, it's got about 25 minutes left to go. So the temperature in the bottle is only 129 degrees. It's not even 140 yet, but the water is the right temperature. However, something really interesting is already happening. And I know it's a pressure differential thing. The closed bottles, we see no activity, okay? The open bottles though, we're seeing a little bit of bubbling. Let me show you. So there you go. There's a view of the open bottle, see? There's a closed one on the left. If you watch closely, you can see little bubbles coming up and it's pretty frequent. It's not like it's just a few. It's a lot of little bubbles. All right, so our time has passed. It's been about a half an hour or so. And what I'm gonna do now is just start taking these bottles out carefully because they're a little bit on the warm side. Do you need your gloves or are you good? I think I'm okay without gloves. I'm just gonna take out two closed ones, two open ones. Well, I'm gonna take them all out, but I'm gonna put the samples, the testers, so to speak, over here. I'm just get everybody else out, get the Immersion circulator put away. Be back in a sec. Okay, so we have pasteurized fully and we now have two warm bottles. They're at about 140 degrees. That's why I want to take a reading on both. So we're going to clarify real quick about what we mean by pasteurization. Right. Technically, these are not pasteurized, okay? Pasteurization is usually used for milk and some other things where it's to kill off a lot of different pathogens and it's done at higher temperatures for longer periods of time. What we're doing is 
yeast killing. Okay, that's it. Above 130 degrees, yeast don't generally survive. So if you break that 130 to 140 degree mark for, you know, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, you have killed your yeast. Now, that doesn't stop other things from growing, but it's not as likely to occur as long as you've been sanitary throughout the process. Now, one caveat. In taking these readings, I realize I may add some oxygen to these two bottles. And you know what? For the effort of science, I'm okay with that because these will probably just get put in the fridge and we'll drink them sooner. Now, I have two sets just in case I need an extra set, but I really only want to mess up or potentially oxygenate two bottles rather than four. So let me start by popping the cap on this guy. There was a little bit of pressure in there. That leads me to think either expansion, which it probably was, or a little bit of CO2 still from, you know, degassing. Now we're going to try to do this as quickly as possible so that we don't have a temper temperature differential between yes. our two samples. I'm going to try. So. Now we know that the density will change with temperature as well. So we want to be careful that, you know, that's why I'm taking two readings, one on each. Okay, so on the closed bottle, our post pasteurization reading is 1.020, which is not surprising. I would expect that it's because it's warmer, it's a little bit less dense. That's just the way things work, expansion. So that's that one. Let me now check, oops, get this back in there. And you know what? I'm going to pour it just because it's such a small amount and there's really no other safe way to do this. So again, these bottles will probably just go right into the fridge. I know a few people are going to hate me for this, for the possible oxidization, but this is, you know, a, a test. Come on. Sometimes you have to sacrifice a little bit for science. So remember, the premise I'm working off of is the density would change if there was less alcohol. In fact, it would actually become more dense, which means it should go up because the density of ethanol is lower than the density of water. So less alcohol means more water means more dense. In theory, how much different is the question? I've always believed that if you left it open that it, you're going to lose a significant amount of alcohol. But like I say, somebody told me different. So I'm really curious. We want to do a fuller test on this, but I just thought of this kind of on the fly while we were waiting. I got to say they're the same. There's no difference. So does that mean that no alcohol was lost? No, but it probably means that a negligible amount was lost. Um, so I might, can't this one now, right? yeah. I may throw up some uh, calculations to see how much alcohol would have been lost to show one point of difference because I can't do that one in my head right now. But um, just I'm curious, like if we lost 1% alcohol, what would the gravity difference be? So was that a definitive test? No. Does it show that it's probably okay to do that sort of pasteurization with the bottles open? I think so. I believe it's actually okay. I've seen several people do it that way. They put tin foil over the tops. Now I just had an open bottle. Now there's a difference between an open bottle with a narrow neck and say a mason jar with a lot of surface area. That might be significantly different. Just like if you used a low wide pot, you're going to lose more to evaporation as well. So that may be playing a huge factor here. But either way, that was kind of neat. And we have seven bottles of our avocado mead to go away. And next up in a couple of days, you'll see the tasting. But thanks for watching this video this far because this was kind of a long one, but there was a lot to cover. And um, hey, if you like this video, look up. There's another one up there. You might like that one too.